right. So, I've written my paper at the back of the room. Um, so, um, this session, it was about some book, right, that was written and in my abstract. Yeah, can I? Let me at least touch it. <laughs> right, so, this is the book that I promised that I would read in order to give this paper. I haven't read it. Um, <laughs> but Ben was very, very kind, and he sent like some scans. He was like, no, please read it. Please, just like, even a little bit of the paper. Just, Susie, actually, just oh, was it? OK, well, well done. You were both very, very kind. And I, I did uh, get through like the first few sentences where Barker sort of kicks off by saying, oh, it was a very interesting session. And these are the themes that I saw coming out of it. The questions were, what is environmental archaeology? How should it be practiced and why? At which point I went, oh, God, I am out. And I stopped reading completely because really my answer to all of these questions is, I don't care. Um, and to be honest, when I got, when I started off, thinking that I wanted to do archaeology, these were not the questions that were in my mind. I didn't even think about wanting to do zoo archaeology. This was not in my mind. None of this stuff was in my mind. And you were saying, like, you know, oh, everybody wanted to be Anna Jones. I didn't want to do that either. I just wanted to learn stuff about the past. I wanted to have my mind stretched. I wanted to have things challenged. I wanted to... Uh, question the belief systems of, that I was being raised with. I mean, my, my parents were very Christian and, and they, they brought me up telling me that there is one God, there is one God and Jesus died for our sins. And I used to say, but, but what about cavemen? What did they do? And that was kind of the thing that I was really interested in. Like, just, I don't believe any of this stuff you're telling me. And maybe there are some questions out there that we could answer through archaeology. So that was what I really wanted to achieve. And I think that as I've gone through my academic career, I've realized that by looking at the relationship between people, landscape, and animals, that's a pretty good route of trying to understand some of this stuff. So with that in mind, I kind of thought, oh, I really ought to go back and read a little bit more of what Graham Barker's saying. You know, I want to answer big questions. And then when I get beyond this bit, I realise that actually that's what he's saying as well. He's kind of set this up as a straw man and then just says, come on, people. It's a collective call to arms. Let's do something. Just get on with your job. Let's answer these big questions. Let's take the lead in research agendas. And I'm very, very pleased that, that's, uh, that I did go back and continue reading that because the reason I'm so underprepared is because this morning I was was just finishing off a PI response to a funding application that I'm desperate to, to get. And so with that in mind, I'm going to talk about that funding application because it's me as a zoo archaeologist or as an environmental archaeologist or, or whatever, I'm trying to take the lead. So what this project is, I mean, we're, we're dealing with the lovely Christian festival of Christmas at the moment, but the project I'm interested in is in the interesting Christian festival of Easter and the proposal that I've put in is called the Easter egg which is an example looking at shifting baselines and trying to change perceptions of this idea of cultural and biological aliens because given that Easter like uh, Christmas is this big Christian festival there's an awful lot of animals that figure quite large in the whole Easter festival because I mean who have we got we've got uh, the Easter bunny um, which is lovely and then um, in other cultures we have the Easter hare um, and of course it's never ever been said what came first the chicken or the rabbit not the chicken or the rabbit the egg or the rabbit it's the chicken that comes first so we have to think about all of these animals and what makes them really really interesting is that given that Easter is this huge part of our cultural heritage and we're like, oh yes, this is what us as good Christians do, we all celebrate Easter, um, none of these animals are native. And the festival is not native, but yet we hold it as this kind of truth of our, of our culture. And so that started to make me think, OK, let's investigate all of this by trying to examine these three animals. So let's put this into the context with these animals not being native. What is native anyway? Well, uh, it would be the case that everything uh, that after the last ice age uh, had sort of arrived before the island got cut off by the sea, that's everything that's called native. And of course, that doesn't really include that many of us, and it doesn't include that many animals. Everything that comes after that point is considered introduced. Now, this shows uh, just a rough graph of the number of introductions that have occurred through time. So we see sort of low-level introductions uh, of different animals all the way through time, and then this big hockey stick curve here into the post-medieval period. Um, and the way that 
we think about these animals is kind of really, really interesting. When the further back in time something was introduced, we go, oh, that's part of our cultural heritage. That is, I've had projects examining animals that have been introduced back in the past. And I think, Terry, I stole an idea off you where you said, you know, these animals are as much a part of our cultural heritage as Stonehenge, Fountains Abbey. And it, it's true, right? But when you come through time, when you get here, suddenly they're not good. They are invasive and therefore very, very bad. Um, and what's interesting in that is that it really parallels uh, the way we think about people as well. So the Romans, good, good. Anglo-Saxons, excellent. Uh, if you've been arriving quite recently, that is not good at all. You are coming over here, taking our jobs, and the same with the animals, coming over here, eating our grass. I think that's one of Terry's as well. Um, so the way that we think then about Animals today as invasives and, and, and people, and, you know, aliens coming over and settling in our country is actually something that we're projecting back onto the past. Whereas, in fact, it's all to do with economics today. And the past was not always the same. For sure, we do see that these um, little peaks that we have correspond when, with periods when the island is pretty well connected with other areas of Europe. And we've kind of used it as a model for understanding trade intensity. Other arguments have looked at how, you know, this diversity has increased our sort of dietary repertoire and all of these sorts of resources. There's been quite a lot of work looking at issues of biodiversity and how these animals, when they've arrived, how do they impact on the landscape and environment? All good questions, right? But what I'm interested in is how they might have changed culture, how they reflect culture, how they actually, the rivalry of these animals may have changed us and brought new ways of thinking. The reason that I thought that is because of a book I once read, unlike this one, actually. Um, so uh, it's a great book by Mary Helms. Um, and in it, it goes on and on, but there are a few things that I extract out, which is that geographical distance, she's done a study of what she calls traditional societies uh, around the world, and says that in many of these traditional societies, geographical distance is equated to supernatural distance. So things that come from far away, uh, perhaps are often associated with gods and ancestors. Um, she talks kind of about the agency of material culture, and I think a lot of people in material studies would go, oh yes, no, no, pots have agency. Who was talking about my bag had agency, you were saying earlier today. Um, okay, so maybe it has agency, um, but animals, you can say to them, come over here, and the animal will go, no, and run off in a different direction. Animals really do have agency. So I think that if these things are true of material culture, they have to be even more true of animals, because animals act back. So let's think then about if we just look at the animals that have been introduced in what I call this kind of respectable period when we're allowed to care about them. Um, these are the animals that we've got. And very often I think we find that these early introduced animals are often associated with sort of religious change, cosmological change. I think Julian? You said that right about the Neolithic cattle. I don't need Neolithic stuff, but you were kind of like, it's all a bit magic and woo. Um, certainly, um, <laughs> uh, when we look at uh, horses arriving in the Bronze Age, for sure this is uh, brought, uh, accompanied by huge sort of religious change and changes in the way that people are thinking about the world. And the work that we've been doing, Holly, at the back and I, on the fallow deer, we can see that the spread of the fallow deer across Europe, in the Roman period at least, does look to be associated with the cult of um, Artemis originally and then Diana. So there are these links between these early arriving animals and shifts in religious belief. So let's see then where our Easter trio fits. So here we are, there we've got our Easter trio, our hare, our chickens and our rabbits. But what do we know then about Easter? about the origins of Easter. <coughs> Anyone? No, we know nothing about the origins of Easter, except there is this one reference in the Venerable Bede, um, who talks about, the, in his reckoning of time, that April is Aostra month, so, and which he links to the goddess Aostra, happening in, in, in around the time that we would then celebrate Easter. And if this is happening around this time, we've got to imagine that it's referring to things that happened before. So I'm going to strike out the rabbit um, from this study because that happened afterwards and what often happens is that uh, when Christian traditions take over something they, they replace the animal and make it Christian and everyone's happy so maybe it's a Christianized version of the hare I don't know but we're going to concentrate on the hare and the chicken okay so these are the zoo archaeological data for chickens and hares uh, in the zoo archaeological record I think I've shown yeah the so 
total of percentage, total, percentage total assemblage. Yep, and then this one here is slightly different scale. So this is the percentage of assemblages in which hairs are represented. Um, but they show kind of similar trends. So in the case of chickens, we see that when they first arrive, um, they're very little represented. And actually, it doesn't look as though they're being used for food. We always imagine that animals are being transported for food. I don't think that's the case. We do see an increase uh, into the Roman period where it does look like they're used for food. And then that drops back again in the early Anglo-Saxon period, around the time that we're seeing uh, references to Aostra in the literature uh, before they become food. And as I said, the hairs show this kind of similar uh, pattern. So an increase, a drop off, and then an increase, which I just wanted to, to throw up there. Um, in terms of these animals being used for food then, well, as I said, it really doesn't look as though chickens, when they're first introduced, are used for food. Uh, we find them in human burials. Um, you can see the head is represented here. Um, and there's literature uh, when Caesar arrives saying, oh, these crazy Britons, they don't eat chickens. They use them for other stuff like maybe cockfighting. And that does seem to be the, the reason that chickens get transported around the world. We see a similar thing happening with hares. Although, as far as I'm aware, Jim, you're probably better placed to answer this. Um, they're not so much in with human remains, but you do find quite a lot of ABGs, these associated bone groups, uh, on some Iron Age sites. There's, there's a goodly number. Um, so this suggests that maybe hares also have some sort of, I'll just say, special significance, which is then perhaps mirrored by the fact that we start to find these lovely little brooches. So I was talking to Nina Crummy, uh, who's a Roman find specialist, and she says, oh, yeah, there are all of these um, lovely brooches, and you can see that this is a distribution from the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And she says, well, it's very interesting that you're suggesting that hares maybe have a religious significance because these plate brooches are known to reference particular deities. So we have them for chickens as well. Um, so this is the distribution then of uh, the, the hair brooches. I was then looking around to see why is there any kind of other information maybe about a goddess, a hair and anything. And I found the work of Philip Shaw, who's at Leicester, he's a linguist. Um, and he has done work on trying to trace the origins of Aostra, one of the northern goddesses. And he suggested that these place names here are also linked to Aostra. They're the only place names that we find in the country where maybe the name is referenced. Or it could just be that they're all in the east of the country. I don't know. Um, but the, they do seem to map fairly well onto the areas that Nina is suggesting, that there's some sort of Celtic hair goddess. And he's saying that there is probably some evidence for some sort of uh, Anglo-Saxon, maybe, um, or pagan hair goddess going on there. So I kind of brought together these sets of data and got very, very excited and thought, I wonder if there's any more that we can do with this. Um, so I looked more into Philip's work and he then says, oh, well, it's quite interesting because we can trace this um, Aostra cult all the way back to pre-Roman Germany, where uh, we have here in this, uh, in Morkenhaf, um, a cult to the Matronie, Matronie, Ostrahenii. <laughs> Um, which Ostrahenii is cognate with Aostra. So this is the same sort of thing going on. And he said that maybe that we could suggest that there is some transfer between these two areas. Um, I contacted him as I had Nina Curry going like, um, so can you tell me, is, 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 are these Ostrahenii, are they all about the brown hair? And he was like, no, no, there's no evidence of brown hairs here. And I went, oh, that's so, such a shame. You know, the trail has run cold. Um, but then I thought, let's look at the genetics. So I found a few papers uh, that were dealing with the genetics of brown hair, modern genetics as well. Just um, there'd been big studies to try and understand where all of these different hair populations had come from. And for sure, they argue that the, the hairs, the brown hairs that we have in Britain are certainly introduced. Um, the, the haplotypes that we find in Britain are not found really in any other part of um, Europe except one place, which is here which is slap bang on top of where those matron Ostrahenii cult was, which was enough for me to go, I've discovered the origins of Easter. And I contacted <laughs> Philip uh, Shaw going, yay, yay, see, there's evidence that, that the science has done it. And then I contacted uh, Nina Crummy and went, see, see, I'm going to run with it. I'm going to run with, we found the origins of Easter. And they both went, 
don't do that. <laughs> um, that would be such a ba bad mistake to do that. And I'm like, why? Why would that be a problem? And they said, because then all of the pagans will come out of the woodwork and go, look, hooray for us. We, you know, we are the one true religion. And I went, ah, well, it's as good as Christianity. So, um, uh, and I'm not saying that I found the origins of Easter. What I'm saying is this is interesting enough to warrant further investigation. And we have done more uh, genetic stuff and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of shoring up even better. So it'd be really, really great to look at this. But what it reveals to me is that we know nothing about the festival that we base all of our ideas around. We know nothing about most of the animals that we then construct policy concerning um, because here we are. This is what's going on at the moment with two, uh, three, all three of our Easter animals. On the one hand, we've got rabbits and, and brown hares that are currently the subject of citizen science mapping projects because people think they're native, well, particularly the brown hare. And they're like, oh, we must conserve them because they came here a long time ago and, and they're obviously really, really important as part of our cultural heritage. Chickens, no one cares about, right? Not at all. Whereas what's really interesting about this is when we look at the genetics of, say, the brown hare, and then we look at the genetics of the modern chicken, particularly within commercial stock, which is part of a, another project that we're working on, the chicken is probably more endangered than the brown hair. But yet, because we don't care or know about any of this stuff, we just blindly adopt things that are based on what we think uh, is probably right or how we feel about these animals. But, you know, we know nothing about them. So I would say that it's something that we perhaps, again, need to think more carefully about. So what are my conclusions? Um, I'm concluding that I want the AHRC <laughs> to uh, fund a big exploration of Easter um, because, you know... If we do that, we can answer big questions about religion and identity. We can address issues that then have a modern re re relevance, whether this is in terms of cultural attitudes to the natural world or in terms of the way that we think about policy or other people as well. I mean, it all goes hand in hand, especially with the sort of human animal studies stuff that shows that there is this parallel between the way that people think about animals and the way that they think about other people. If we do this, it will make Graham Barker proud. And that's, you know, something that I ought to try and do because I used him so nastily as a setup in this. Um, so uh, I forgot that I'd put that in. Um, um, I wonder where I was going with this. OK, I think, yes, I know. Um, environmental archaeology is like Christianity in the sense that a lot of people seem to buy into it, but it doesn't work for me. Um, so, you know, if enough people buy into it, OK, that's, that's good enough but it, it doesn't work for me. In fact, I would say that environmental archaeology is perhaps a little better because at least you get some data out of it, um, which um, we can then uh, integrate and, uh, and examine to answer interesting questions. But what I would say, and I think this is picking up things that other people have said, is that the data are just data. Right? They're completely meaningless. And all of the stuff within environmental archaeology is just data. Why did we get into archaeology in the first place? Was it to narrow down and answer really nerdy questions about hair bones or... No, it's not interesting. None of us got into it for this reason. Of course, we need to have specialisms, but we're trying to answer bigger questions. So if we're going to try and answer them, I would say... Like, Richard was talking about something earlier today. I came in halfway through. Something about post humanism but it was all about connections and interconnectivity and what I would say is I agree with that I don't know what you're talking about but I think it sounds a bit like this which is elemental theory and humoral principles which if you want to find out what this symbol refers to it's like something from the Illuminati or something um, you can come to a session which is last up uh, tomorrow where all will be revealed like the origins of Easter there we go <laughs>